you for joining us for this expression of worship. Gentry Park United Methodist Church not only worships Jesus, but also serves Jesus. Our food pantry ministry is feeding 240 households a week. The people are deeply grateful, and we are grateful to you for your partnership with us in this ministry. As we share in Christian worship and service, know that we thank God for you and that we remain committed to sharing in ministry in whatever ways we can. We are always just an email, text, or believe it or not, phone call away. Everywhere you look, everywhere you go, every moment of every day, from the rise of the dawn to the setting of the sun, from the first cup of coffee to the last bedtime story, at work, in school, 
among friends, and with your family. During trials and storms, triumphs and victories, on your worst day and in your finest moment, He is near. For our God dwells with us and abides in us. His presence surrounds us, and His Spirit is inescapable. He loves us with an unimaginable affection and cares for us with an unfathomable passion. Everywhere you look, everywhere you go, God is near. Our scripture reading for this expression of worship is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. Listen now for the word of God. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have my seminary degree framed in an unusual way with a frame that has glass on both sides. The reason that I have this unusual frame for my seminary degree is because I actually have two degrees for the same course of studies. At the time of our actual graduation, we were given degrees that had a mistake. The degrees are issued in Latin, a language which we never heard a single class lecture given in, but because it was Princeton Theological Seminary, and you might say that there is some pretentiousness about being an Ivy League institution, a degree issued in plain old simple English was not deemed sufficient to document our academic achievements. The mistake in the first degree that was given to us on the day of our graduation inverted our names and the name of the degree that we had been awarded. Both the president of the seminary and the chair of the board of trustees had signed their names to the faulty degrees. It was several months later that I received a package containing the second degree, explaining the mistake and asking the recipients to destroy the first degree that had been issued. Of course, I hadn't even noticed, and I know that it will shock you and disappoint you to learn that I don't typically use Latin in my sermon preparations or much else that I do. Yes, I had two years of Latin, but I didn't look at the degree closely enough to recognize that a mistake had been made. I wasn't about to destroy the first degree issued on the day of graduation because I thought it was a wonderful illustration of how my grandparents' generation warned about getting too big for your britches. The culture of my grandparents always had a great deal of suspicion about what can be characterized as educated fools. That is, people who have a great deal of education but seem to have lost their common sense, or they would have said horse sense, that is, understanding what's obvious to everyone else. I have a photo of my Uncle Frank, who never wore anything but bib overalls and had hard jobs all of his life, that I've kept over my desk wherever I've had an office. 
He had great disdain for pastors because he thought pastors are lazy people who didn't really want to work a real job and got an education to avoid having to do real work. Although he died before I became a pastor and did not have to bear the burden of knowing what I had done, he's always looking down on me in my office to remind me about the dangers of becoming an educated fool. In a culture filled with disinformation, deception, and media manipulation, I thought it appropriate for us to consider the potential for becoming educated fools. We need to appreciate that education does not necessarily make people wiser. Book sense and technological savvy often replaces common sense, and it can make us look like we don't have much sense at all. Tom Mullen wrote about an engineer, a psychologist, and a theologian who were hunting in the wilds of northern Canada. They came across an isolated cabin far removed from any town. Because friendly hospitality is a virtue practiced by those who live in the wilderness, the hunters knocked on the door to ask permission to rest. No one answered their knocks, but discovering the cabin was unlocked, they entered. It was a simple place, two rooms with a minimum of furniture and household equipment. Nothing was surprising about the cabin except the stove. It was large, pot-bellied, and made of cast iron. What was unusual was its location. It was suspended in mid-air by wires attached to the ceiling beams. Fascinating, said the psychologist. It's obvious that this lonely trapper, isolated from humanity, has elevated his stove so he can curl up under it and vicariously experience a return to the womb. Nonsense, replied the engineer. The man is practicing the laws of thermodynamics. By elevating his stove, he has discovered a way to distribute heat more evenly throughout the cabin. With all due respect, interrupted the theologian, I'm sure that hanging his stove from the ceiling has religious meaning. Fire lifted up has been a religious symbol for centuries. The three debated the point for several minutes without resolving the issue. When the trapper finally returned, they immediately asked him why he had hung his heavy pot-bellied stove by wires from the ceiling. His answer was succinct and simple. Have plenty of wire, not much stovepipe. We live in a time and a place in which it's all too easy to become educated fools. Our society is full of educational opportunities and we are probably the most well-educated generation in history. Our age will likely be known to future generations as the information age. It is said of the Sorbonne in Paris that it housed 1,338 books in 1292 and represented all of humanity's accumulated knowledge up until that time. Today, there are about that many books printed every day. My own grandparents went from riding behind a horse in a buggy to watching astronauts land on the moon. Our technology now makes possible what was inconceivable only a hundred years ago. We are some of the most educated people to live on the planet, and yet we find ourselves unable to resolve human problems as old as the planet. We have been taught to believe that if we only educate people, that things will get better. But substance abuse, violence, sexual scandal, and a variety of other social problems should teach us that we people don't necessarily do what we should just because we're better educated. We even use our education to rationalize avoiding our responsibilities and duties. Cal Holm captures its tendency in the story about two sociologists walking down the street and seeing a man lying at the curb who is covered with cuts and bruises from a terrible mugging. 
One of the sociologists turns to his colleague and comments as they pass the injured man, whoever did this terrible deed really needs our help. Our ever increasing knowledge, which makes us the most educated people in human history, has not necessarily made us any wiser. And we too easily become educated fools. Now, please understand, I'm not suggesting the worn out diatribe, which pits faith against education. One of the slogans of United Methodism has been reuniting the two so long divided, vital knowledge and vital piety. Christian theology places a high value on education and calls on us to get as much education as we can. But it also recognizes that education is only one dimension of a truly wise person. In our scripture reading, Paul addresses the issue of some who claim to have a special knowledge and which had consequently caused divisions in the church. Many scholars see these opponents of Paul as the forerunners of what later became known as Gnosticism. Gnostics claimed to have a special knowledge that others didn't, and they understood it to put them in a privileged position with God. Paul spends the opening chapters of 1 Corinthians challenging this claim, and in our scripture reading, he describes a deeper wisdom that the know-it-alls in Corinth had failed to understand. He goes on to write about the paradox of Christian wisdom when he advises the Corinthians and in turn advises us, if you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom of Christian faith is that the deepest truths of human life, but even more importantly, the deepest theological truths are often paradoxical, not what we would naturally expect or logically conclude. The declaration of God taking human form, suffering the humiliation of a crucifixion, and then being resurrected are not the sort of religious claims that one would naturally expect or logically conclude. Paul reminds us that it requires a wisdom that goes beyond our knowledge and helps us to understand the depths of God's love for us. As we consider the paradoxical wisdom of our Christian faith that can help us to avoid becoming educated fools, I want to suggest that our faith paradoxically calls us to become educated fools in another sense. It is to say that our Christian faith can help us to come to an understanding that enables one type of educated fools to see the wisdom of another type of educated fools. The story is told of Charles Darwin traveling in the South Seas Islands in search of the missing link for his theory of evolution. He studied the cannibals and was certain that there was no more primitive human anywhere. He concluded that he had found a lower stratum of humanity to fit his theory of evolution. Darwin returned to the islands 34 years later and discovered the schools and churches established there by the missionary John Patton. Darwin was so impressed that he made a generous contribution to the London Missionary Society and determined that his missing link remained missing. The challenge that is before us in the call of our faith to be an educated fool may be better appreciated with a story that took place in Japan following the Second World War. The country had been devastated by the war and the economy was in shambles. Unemployment approached 60%. People came to the home of a U.S. Army officer and his wife who were stationed there during that time looking for work. 
One man said that he could do wonders with the woman's garden if she would only give him a chance. Since the man spoke little English, the wife, through sign language and paper and pencil, gave him instructions about where to plant, prune, and pamper her garden. He listened politely and followed her instructions exactly. The garden emerged as the finest in the neighborhood. When she finally realized that her new gardener knew more about the matter than she, the wife stopped giving him directions and let him freely care for the garden. It was magnificent. Then one day the gardener came with an interpreter who expressed the appreciation, but also the regrets of the gardener. He will no longer be able to care for your garden. He must leave, the interpreter told her. The wife expressed her regrets and asked where he was going. The interpreter replied that he was returning to his old job as the professor of horticulture at the University of Tokyo. As people of faith, we should recognize that it will be challenging to be an educated fool when we find ourselves with the other kind of educated fools. The power of the notion that Christian people are called to avoid being educated fools by making certain that they are educated fools may be best related in an episode at Duke University recorded by Will Willem. Talk about a recruiter from the Teach for America program, a program which attempts to recruit bright young prospective teachers from colleges and university campuses to teach in America's most difficult and deprived school systems, speaking to the students at Duke. As she faced an auditorium full of Duke students, she said, looking at you tonight, I don't know why I'm here. You are privileged, the beneficiaries of the best this nation's educational resources has to offer. I can tell just by looking at you, you are all bound for Wall Street, law school, med school, and here I stand, trying to recruit you for a salary of 15000 a year in some of the worst school situations in America, begging you to waste your life for a bunch of ungrateful kids in the backwoods of Appalachia or the inner city of Philadelphia. I must have been crazy to come here, but I do have some information up here, and I would be willing to talk with anybody who happens to be interested. But I know just by looking at you that all of you want to be a success. Here I am inviting you to be failures. But if by chance somebody here feels called to do the worst job any of you can imagine, then I'm here to talk to you. The meeting is over. With that, Willman wrote that everyone stood up and stampeded to the front fighting over a chance to talk to this recruiter, just dying to give their lives to something more than conventional American success, dying to give themselves to something bigger and more important than themselves. When I've done confirmation classes over the years, I've always took the kids on a weekend trip to Philadelphia and New York, where there's lots of old churches and missions. One of the missions where I always took the kids is called the Bowery Mission in New York City. The Bowery Mission serves the homeless and they provide a hot breakfast, lunch, or dinner following a worship service they have in their chapel. The service is filled with the most broken people found on the streets of New York City, people struggling with addiction and mental health disorders. They are dirty and disheveled. I always had the groups worship there, as well as eat with the folks after the service. One year as we were listening to the music, I was thinking to myself that the group leading the music that morning was pretty good. And I was thinking that I ought to invite them to come to our church sometime. When I asked the director who they were, I learned that they were members of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. I thought to myself, well, I guess they are pretty good. But then I made sure that the kids understood 
that we were listening to some of the best musicians in the world in one of the worst places in the world because I wanted them to understand that these musicians who could have been performing that morning wherever they wanted had the wisdom to understand that Christian faith taught them that was where they should be. The question for us is whether we have the wisdom to be an educated fool.